Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Core Connections 2023. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Emily Chadwick and work as an electrical safety officer for Technical Safety BC. Each year, as a part of our commitment to safety in British Columbia, we host our annual public meeting, Core Connections providing an opportunity for clients and safety partners across the province to connect with us. Today, I am joining you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Squamish Nation, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and Musqueam Nation. I recognize and respect them as nations in this territory, as well as their historic connection to the land and waters around us since time immemorial. As an organization, we are committed to improving relationships and our own understanding of Indigenous people and their communities. Today, we will share an update of our activities and priorities over the last year and review our 2022 financial res results and 2023 outlook. You will also have an opportunity to ask our board chair and executive team questions during the Q&A session. This will be followed by two breakout sessions, one on climate risk to the safety system and the other about our approach to assessments. Before we dive in, I wanted to share that closed captioning is available by clicking the captions button at the bottom of your screen. As a reminder, the session is being recorded. We have a busy agenda this morning, so let's begin. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Marcy McDougall, Technical Safety BC's Leader of Indigenous Reconciliation and Partnership. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Emily. I'd like to extend my gratitude to all the Indigenous peoples and nations on whose traditional territories we are fortunate to live our lives, conduct our work, and raise our families. I'm speaking to you today from the unceded homeland of the Sequetum and Sequetumstein speaking peoples in the interior region of Tecumloops. I'd like to share with you all some highlights and insights into Technical Safety BC's reconciliation journey. As an organization that has existed within the provincial ministries and is mandated by government legislation, it is fair to say that Technical Safety BC is part of the colonial system and as such is committed to the discovery of meaningful reconciliation through the direct engagement of Indigenous voices, wisdom, and insight. Our Indigenous Reconciliation and Partnerships Department was officially established in January of 2022. And it is with the vision to support safe technical systems in all Indigenous communities by centering Indigenous perspectives that we stay true to our mandate of safe technical systems everywhere. Our reconciliation strategy is really based on the core fundamentals of allyship, oh, sorry, safety and connection. In context of the history of this time and space that we live in, we rely on technology to build bridges of connection and services to support resilient communities in the most remote areas of our beautiful landscape. The inherent wisdom of Indigenous people has come full circle to advise those systems to not only work in connection with one another, but in the growing force of climate interaction to also work within nature as a part of this structure, intrinsic. It is in the spirit of all things being related that we at Technical Safety BC seek to repair, rebuild and fortify Indigenous connection from a place of learning and listening to those voices that speak from the wisdom of history and understanding. Allyship requires us to be directed, to act with meaning and to advocate for and amplify direct feedback from the Indigenous communities we serve. So what does this mean? To begin with, it requires us to ask questions, to make discovery, and begin to understand the priorities, challenges, and values of each Indigenous community in the province. Each nation is unique, and through connection and engagement, we will determine how to build our resources to support their goals of building resilient communities. Through collaboration internally with our climate, marketing insights and engagement, operations and communications teams, to name a few, we acknowledge that we are in this together. Everyone, everyone has a part to play in the action of reconciliation. 
Externally, we are working in support of the partnerships between many Indigenous organizations, such as the First Nations Housing and Infrastructure Council, the BC Assembly of First Nations, and learning institutions, including Simon Fraser University and the University of Victoria, to create informative research and regulatory advisements through a grant from the Pacific Institute of Climate Solutions. We just completed an informative workshop that will help identify partnership nations in remote, remote and rural areas to collaborate, identify, and innovate intuitive resolutions to the growing challenges of climate events, from fires to floods, atmospheric rivers and heat domes, and ultimately food security. It is Indigenous connection to land and nature that will provide invaluable insights into community design and planning to foster proactivity and readiness. At the instruction of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 92 calls to action, Technical Safety BC has formally adopted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as its framework for reconciliation. Through enhanced understanding and education of Indigenous historical heritage, we seek to honor the education or the accounting of true history and continue navigating from a place of learning as we build cultural competency and connection. It's important to incorporate practices such as territorial acknowledgements in our business protocol and cultural language and names in our location, which we've done, but this is only the beginning of our journey. And with that, I thank you for making time to hear my message, and I hand it back to you, Emily. Thank you for sharing, Marcy. Our next presenters this morning are Technical Safety BC's Board Chair, George Abbott, and our President and Lead Executive Officer, Bill Gotek. George Abbott was first elected as an MLA for the Shoe Schwab in 1996. Since then, he served as minister of several ministries, including Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation, Aboriginal and Women's Services, and Sustainable Resource Management, just to name a few. He was also Deputy, Deputy House Leader for the official opposition before his retirement from government. Welcome, George. Good morning. Uh, pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm George Abbott, Chair of the Board at Technical Safety BC. On behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome you to Core Connections 2023 and thank you for your commitment to our safety system. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from Greater Victoria, home of the unceded territories of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasainach First Nations. 2022 was an eventful year for Technical Safety BC and our important safety work around the province. The board supported our president and lead executive officer, Phil Goth, and his team as they launched a new organizational strategy designed to build trust and confidence, not only in our organization, but in a safety system that improves the well being of all British Columbians. Our board is committed to ensuring that the organization makes safe, fair, transparent, and collaborative decisions. The job of the board is to confirm that all major issues affecting the business are given proper consideration, including how decisions may impact industry, community, and government. One of our most important functions is to oversee our strategy. Our updated strategy provides a clear focus to better serve our clients and partners with achievable goals and measurable outcomes. And most importantly, the strategy will guide initiatives of investments that will improve transparency, accessibility, value for money, and safety for years to come. Our annual report, which is public as of today, provides an overview of how we are advancing the strategy, including our financial results. In addition, our state of safety provides a detailed overview of the work we are doing to improve safety in British Columbia. Our board's very pleased with how the organization made progress on several key initiatives in 2022. We continued to move forward with a multi-year business transformation initiative, digitalizing services, and simplifying tools to better facilitate access to the safety system. In short, our board is confident in the leadership and direction of Te Technical Safety BC and how the organization is working with partners across our province to improve safety, identify and address hazards, and make people informed, safety-minded decisions. Looking forward, part of, our, part of achieving our mandate 
is playing our role on a variety of new initiatives from the province of British Columbia, including on clean energy and infrastructure and housing. We're also working to incorporate the provincial government's Clean BC plan into our safety system, including integrating cleaner energy technologies such as hydrogen, heat pumps, and EV charging infrastructure. The government is also looking at electrification for remote project, remote parts of the province, including northern or isolated communities that are reliant on less sustainable forms of energy. This is a good thing, but it comes with challenges to keep systems and people safe. The Technical Safety BC team will be there to play our part as these plans and technologies come close to reality. The board will also be continuing to support Technical BC, Technical Safety BC in its important reconciliation work with the Indigenous peoples and First Nations in the province. In 2022, we furthered our pledge to work together with Indigenous people towards technical safety by referencing item 92, business and reconciliation of the truth and reconciliation calls to action. And finally, there is the reality of the changing face of British Columbia. More generally, we are as a population getting older. With that comes changing requirements in homes and other buildings, ensuring that our safety system is meeting the needs of all British Columbians today and tomorrow. Similarly, with even more people expected to move to our province from elsewhere in Canada and the world, Technical Safety BC must be positioned to reach those groups in a way that makes the safety system accessible to everyone. Let me end with a thank you. Thank you to all of you, our, our partners and clients for the role you play in our safety system and your hard work in partnership with the Technical Safety BC team over the past year. Safety truly is a shared responsibility and all of you play, play a key role in ensuring the system is effective. We as a board will continue to provide guidance and support to the team in all of those areas as Te Technical Safety BC continues to make progress towards its vision of safe technical systems everywhere. Once again, on behalf of the board of directors, I applaud the successful year that was 2022 and look forward to seeing even more positive results through the year ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, again, uh, look forward to the discussion today. And now I'd like to turn it over to Phil Goth, Technical Safety BC's President and Lead Executive Officer. Over to you, Phil. Well, good morning. Thank you, George, and good morning, everyone. I'm Phil Gota, I'm President and Lead Executive Officer of Technical Safety BC. And I too start by acknowledging that I'm privileged to be speaking to you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Welcome to Core Connections 2023. To our clients, partners, Technical Safety BC employees, and everyone else joining us today, I extend a heartfelt welcome and thank you. Thank you for your time, your interest and your expertise, and mostly thank you for your commitment to safety and for doing your part in our journey to make British Columbia an even safer place. It is rewarding to observe the progress we continue to make together toward our safety goals. And I use the word together deliberately because this is a journey that we indeed pursue together. Safety is a shared responsibility, and all of us have a role to play. I spoke about that shared responsibility quite a bit in my remarks one year ago when I introduced the concept of safety at scale and our commitment to working with our clients and partners. This year, I'd like to build on this idea even further. What continues to be affirmed for me is that safe technical systems are mostly about the people interacting with them. For Technical Safety BC to be effective and for the safety system to be successful, we need to drive even more intently toward being a people-centric organization. And that is exactly what we are striving to do. When we dig into what actually drives safety, it's people. At its core, it's people who bring the safety system to life. It is all about you. It is everyone from the contractor working around gas lines on Vancouver Island, to our safety officer verifying a chairlift upgrade in the Kootenays, to the technician servicing a residential furnace in Metro Vancouver. 
Safety is a shared responsibility and commitment. And ultimately, it is about human behavior and how our focus and decision-making, our faults and our ingenuity intersect and interact with the equipment and systems people rely on. Last year, we completed 81 investigations that allowed us to better understand contributing causes and the impact of people on safety. Two major incidents we investigated stand out. One, a fatal ammonia leak at a former ice making facility on Tecumloops to Sequequem, excuse me, to Sequequem territory in Kamloops. Got it out, thank you. And an explosion from a gas line incident in Comox. In both cases, it wasn't the equipment that failed. It was human error and decisions made by people who that led to unfortunate and devastating outcomes. It's about people. This is where we must align and focus our safety efforts on people's attention, knowledge, and decision-making as a critical driver of safety and the shared role that we all play in keeping our systems and people safe. Last year, I spoke to you about safety at scale and our mission, my mission as lead executive officer to ensure that you see value in your interactions with Technical Safety BC and the safety system. I talked about our aspiration to build confidence in us as the regulator and also in the safety system more broadly. Now, a year later, I'm inspired by the progress we've made. We are a safety regulator, so we are working and will continue to work with our clients to make sure things are operating safely and that you and your organizations are adhering to proper standards and regulations. And your participation and good judgment are equally critical to the system functioning as it should. Our goal is to make it easier for you to make good decisions in favor of safer outcomes. We also know that we need to reduce what we refer to as unproductive friction in the system. In other words, to identify where we are slowing you down unnecessarily, where we can make it simpler and easier for you to safely do your work. Here are a few examples. In 2022, we sought to improve digital access to our products and services. We enhanced our digital tools, consolidating processes and eliminating a whole host of deterrents. This has allowed you to make better supported and confident decisions. We built a new website with ease of use and accessibility as top priorities. It's mobile friendly and has an improved search function. We also designed an app for elevating hoist remote assessments based directly on feedback from contractors and our safety officers. This app marks a significant step for remote assessments. Our analysis has found that once someone uses the app for the second time, they see a more than 50% improvement in inspection speed. In other words, better safety in less time. You'll see us continue to develop more digital tools over time to support seamless interactions. We'll also ask you how we can better support you in a way that makes interactions with us more efficient. What additional tools, training, or innovation can we develop to reduce friction that doesn't serve any meaningful safety purpose? In 2022, our safety officers completed close to 57,000 in-person and remote assessments, allowing us to increase our reach and presence, especially in outlying parts of BC. You will continue to see remote assessments playing a prominent role where it makes both operational and safety sense. If you're interested in this topic, I invite you to join the upcoming breakout session on our approach to assessments. We are upgrading our certification experience. And while we are still working out some of the bugs that come with any major software release, we are pleased that nearly 8,000 clients have now accessed our new portal and many certificate renewal applications take less than one day to be processed. Our new public registry launched concurrently with our website 
enables industry and members of the public to easily search to find a licensed contractor in any of the regulated technologies we oversee. They can also easily verify that contractors are licensed and have a history of safe work. We also implemented changes to require that licensed contractors publish their company name and license number when advertising their services to the public. This will help deter unlicensed workers from advertising unauthorized services and educate the public on the importance of the issue. So all this is uh, work is important, but the reality is we don't always get it right. Those of you who have been affected by our design registration service issues know this firsthand. Challenges with our internal capacity have impacted our service levels and the client experience. Our team has mounted a robust response, is working diligently to keep you informed and supported, and is committed to learning and improving from this experience. Thank you for your patience and understanding as we work through the backlog. Another challenge we face is the economic headwinds impacting all of your businesses, as well as ours here at Technical Safety BC. Our VP of Finance, Wesley Ma, will discuss this in more detail, but I'd like to make a few comments. Technical Safety BC is a self-funded, people-centric organization. We too are impacted by inflation. We signed a new contract with employees this past year, and the agreement reflects the rising cost of living. We also know that many of you are struggling with inflation and rising costs in your business and on your teams, not to mention continued supply chain challenges. Our safety officers will continue to support you while not compromising on safety, providing guidance and insight on working through regulatory requirements. So while this is a challenging economic time, I'm confident that by focusing on people with our collaborative approach, we can and will get through it together. I'd also like to take a moment to look forward. We continue to view climate events and the unknowns they introduce as one of British Columbia's biggest challenges. We experienced a drought last summer that lasted until Halloween in many parts of the province. We just saw a new record for Metro Vancouver with snow six months in a row. And with record-breaking heat in May, we now have both floods and forest fires impacting the province. Last year, we completed the first phase of a climate hazard inventory for electrical, gas, boilers, pressure vessels, refrigeration, and elevating technologies. This inventory integrates climate hazards into our risk register, so we can treat climate risk as systematically as we treat our safety risks or other safety risks. Our team continues to prioritize strategies and actions that help us bolster our safety system against climate hazards. If you're interested in this topic, I invite you to join the breakout session on climate action after this, after this meeting. In all our areas of focus, the need to continue Technical Safety, Safety BC's reconciliation journey with Indigenous communities across the province is a focus, continues to be, and it endures. Not imposing regulatory approaches or colonial mindsets, but seeking to work in true partnership with First Nations to achieve our shared safety goals. Our commitment to this journey is also reflected in our work with the Tecumloops First Nation in Kamloops on the ammonia incident I mentioned earlier. We worked with the Tecumloops Nation in partnership on this investigation, something we hadn't done before. We will continue to do much more of this moving forward. So let me end by saying there are indeed challenges ahead. Some we, some we can see coming, others are difficult to anticipate. But our organization and the safety system made up of all of us are ready to face these obstacles. I'm inspired and optimistic about the direction Technical Safety BC is headed, the incredible work being done by our team and yours, the innovations, 
the people-centric approach that will not only help us to work better together today, but will lead to an even safer British Columbia in the years to come. Thank you. And with that, I'll now have the, hand the proceedings back to Emily. Thank you, George and Phil. Now please join me in welcoming Wesley Ma, our Vice President of Finance to provide our 2022 financial update and how we're tracking so far in 2023. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Wesley Ma, Vice President of Finance with Technical Safety BC. I'm very pleased to be here um, to provide you with a summary of our 2022 financial performance and talk about the forecast for 2023. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from Burnaby on the traditional unceded territory of Musqueam, uh, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. As Phil and George mentioned, these are not easy times. Um, 2022 was a year that truly tested our financial resilience. As a non-for-profit organization, we do not receive any government funding. All of our revenue comes from the service we provided. Last year, like many in BC, we were also impacted by the global supply chain disruption, economic downturn, and slow residential housing starts in BC. We experienced a revenue gap from our budget of close to 6 million. This was similar to the gap we experienced in 2020 due to the COVID. To ensure that the service to our client would continue smoothly, we took cost-saving measures throughout the organization by cutting discretionary spendings, like travel and trainings, and closely monitoring the financial landscape. Through this focus, we met our budgeted bottom line target and stayed within a target of 1 million in deficit. Our total service revenue was 70, 79 million in 2022, and we had 1 million lost from investment and other income. And we ended 2022 with on budget result, healthy cash flow, and the reserve at a manageable level. If you'd like to learn more about our financial last year, um, please take a look through our annual report located on our website. This report details the operational cost, revenue by technologies, and much more. This year, 2023, we continue to face challenges alongside many of our clients and safety partners. High construction costs, global supply chain issue, and high borrowing rates. There's no question that those factors impact our organization as those factors may negatively affect your business. We're forecasting a decline in permit volume this year, as much as 10%. We have conservatively budget for 2023 and we have already seen a drop in permit volume, more than 5% in the first quarter this year. The decline is especially true for installation permit in the residential sector. But let me assure you that our level of service to clients will not be affected. We will make sure to maintain our expenditure and to support our client in the best way possible. This means we will concentrate on what is the most important to us, which is our client and partners who do their part in the safety system. We will make processes cleaner, easier. We will make the transaction less painful and faster. We will help educate and collaborate with you. And we will continue to explore ways to make sure you feel your association with us is worthwhile. And despite the challenge we are facing together, the financial outlook for the rest of the year remains cautiously optimistic. Um, the inflation and the borrowing rate may have peaked and the employment rate remains high. We believe there's a demand for housing in the residential sector. And recently, the, uh, the, the province announced the investment plan to support 12 billion worth of large-scale infrastructure in the next 10 years. So we will continue to monitor those market conditions and assess risk for sustaining our financial performance. As always, Technical Safety BC is committed 
to putting revenue directly back into the safety system, whether times are good or bad. Uh, our refreshed website features better functionality to make it easier to find what you're looking for. It's more inclusive for those with color vision impairment and accessible to adapt to newer technologies like smartwatch, so clientele will come uh, with us on the go. We also initiate public safety campaigns and educational events aimed to spread knowledge and attract more people to our safety system. So I invite you to learn more about the details in the new State of Safety Report, which is available on our website. As we continue forward together during this uncertain time, I'd like to share with you a quote from a famous business author, uh, Tony Swash. The opposite of certainty isn't uncertainty. It's openness, curiosity, and the willingness to embrace paradox rather than choosing the upside. So let's embrace this uncertainty time and grow together. So that's my finish update. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wesley. This brings us to the question period. For those wishing to submit questions, please use the Q&A function available at the bottom of your screen. This is an opportunity for you as clients and safety partners to provide feedback share ideas, and have your questions answered by our executive team and our board chair. We will answer as many questions as possible, and questions may not be answered in the order they are received. Any questions we cannot get to during this session will be posted on our website, along with the recordings from today's events. Okay, I think with that, you're handing it over to me, Emily, and thank you very much. So what I'm going to endeavor to do, we're getting uh, questions uh, coming in, and I will try to read them um, as clearly as possible. If I could just maybe ask something from those who are putting questions forward, if it's a very, very long question, it's, it's more difficult for me to read and then uh, hand out, so I'll do my best. And uh, I'm also going to ask different members of the executive team to come off camera and answer some of the questions that come forward. So with that, I'll start with the first one, and it is, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Derek Patterson, our Vice President of Regulatory Leadership and Corporate Secretary to take this one. And it says, uh, I had a customer refuse to get a permit for a water heater installation in Maple Ridge. The homeowner went with a cheaper contractor and that did not require a permit. We submitted a complaint to the city with the address and all required information. We received an email from the city stating, thank you for your submission. At this time, there is no bylaw violation to enforce upon. I will inform the area bylaw compliance officer of your correspondence. Um, and then what exactly is your relationship with the city of Maple Ridge? Was our complaint denied because we do not work, you we do not work live in Maple Ridge. So Derek, I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit our relationship um, and make some comments on that question. Sure, happy to do that, Phil, and thank you for the question. Uh, so it sounds like you are a licensed contractor, and so I'd first just say uh, good for you, it sounds like, to uh, not take on work if the customer was not willing to take out a permit for it. So we, uh, we appreciate your commitment to working within the safety system. Um, Maple Ridge is one of the local governments in BC that has delegated authority for electrical and gas work. Uh, and so we, we do have a group where we keep in touch with the other local governments and we share practices. And even with, uh, we offer support to some of the local governments when it comes to compliance matters. I think you did the uh, right thing for submitting your concern to Maple Ridge. Uh, if you think that the contractor that was retained did not obtain a permit. Sounds like they've taken a look at it and they don't see an issue with that. To the extent you're concerned that it is just an administrative response and maybe someone with uh, a bit more seniority should have eyes on it, you could share that, uh, your concern with us and we could contact our contacts at Maple Ridge just to see if there is something worth following up on here. and. No, I would not say that they would not consider your complaint just because you uh, do not 
work or well, you do not live in uh, Maple Ridge, I wouldn't think that would be that that wouldn't be a factor. If they thought that work was being done in their jurisdiction um, and perhaps without a permit, that they would take interest in that. So that would be uh, hopefully that's helpful to you. Great, thanks very much, Derek. Um, I'm going to go. A next question is about engineering and uh, the engineering and geoscientists of BC. So I'm going to ask Abraham Van Portley, our um, VP of Data Analytics and Decision Science, and is also our uh, senior engineer in the organization. So, Ob, Technical Safety BC, uh, I think the question is asking uh, are we uh, do we have? Are we legislated, or do we have any? Uh, are are we subject to the legislations of uh, engineering and geoscientists? And if you could confirm that. Thank you, Phil, and uh, thank you for the question. Uh, registered professionals, uh, and of course, professional engineers play an important role in the safety system. So we do have interactions with the uh, engineers and geoscientists of British Columbia, EGBC. Um, and I think that there are three main ways in which uh, how that interaction looks like. Uh, sometimes, so that's the first item, um, our own legislation requires a professional engineer to be involved. Um, so, so that is a very clear case, uh, the person has to be registered with uh, ETBC and uh, we make sure that uh, that is indeed the case. In a second area, we require, uh, and, and that is uh, probably the, the, the main interest that the person ha uh, has who asked this question, given the reference to, uh, to, to the Alberta Boiler Association, um, where our legislation requires a person to be qualified. In many cases, uh, that may be an engineer, and uh, we will make sure that uh, indeed we, we, we check for qualifications there as well. We also have other people who are qualified, for example, engineers registered in other provinces or um, people deemed qualified under ASME standards. So, so there are a few different routes for people to be qualified. And uh, that's important because it's a very international business uh, with engineering and the design set we are registered in BC. A last item that I want to point out is that sometimes we deal with very complex situations. And um, in, in those cases, we may require uh, the client to work with a professional engineer um, to make sure that uh, all the uh, um, more detailed aspects of a complex design are properly dealt with. So I hope this provides um, an overview of the interaction that we have with uh, EGBC and I'm happy to uh, take more detailed questions uh, offline if there are further uh, inquiries in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ab. So the next question I'm going to ask uh, Kate Bailey, our Vice President of Marketing and Communication, to take, and it's about uh, training and educational opportunities. It reads, when will you be addressing the lack of opportunity Technical Safety BC is providing to contractors to continue keeping their licenses required training that you have forced? There is limited to no opportunities locally on Southern Vancouver Island. Kate Bailey, could you speak to that? Uh, I certainly can. And thank you, Phil. And thank you for the question. Um, I'm going to make a couple of assumptions about the questioner, um, that you are an electrical FSR or within that industry, um, because that's where we've most recently uh, change the regulations around required training. So accessibility to training is extremely important to us. And when we put the requirement for training into the regulation, we had a discussion with training providers in the province who already do electrical training and electrical code training. Um, and they um, assured us at the time and asked us at the time um, to let them manage this market. Um, we had obviously created a market for training and they were very confident and are very confident that they can serve it. 
Um, we also committed at the time to monitor to make sure that that people did have access to training where they needed it. Um, so I'd love to actually hear more from this questioner. You can reach out to me directly or you can reach out to engage at technicalsafetybc.ca um, to talk a little bit more about what you're experiencing um, in your market, because we absolutely do want to make sure that this training is accessible to everybody that needs it. Um, if I fail to answer your question because my assumptions are erroneous, uh, by all means, please also reach out to me directly um, uh, or through engage at technicalsafetybc.ca, and we will get your question answered more specifically um, for your technology and your certification. Uh, thank you again for the question. Thank you, Kate. Uh, the next question is going to be about our digitalization, and it's going to be for Claudio Pini, who is our Vice President of Business Transformation and Technology. And the question, Claudio, is how important does TSBC think about making sure website and portal functionality is working as intended? The new portal has not been working since March. Claudio? Yeah, thank you, Phil, and thank you for asking the question. Uh, we consider it very important that our website and our portal work properly. We went live with a new system to process certifications, exam bookings and payments in March. And we know that some clients had experience issues trying to log in uh, to the new portal. And I apologize to you if you are one of those clients. Uh, we are aware of the problems and we are working to solve these issues as quickly as we can. We have received feedback from clients also that when they are able to log in and everything works well, the system is actually easier to use and faster than the old one and they get their certification faster than before. But again, we know it's not working for everyone. We are, we are working on it. Uh, we have already resolved some of the issues and it's our top priority to solve all the major issues we, we encounter as soon as we can. Hey, thank you, Claudio. Uh, I'm going to go back to Ab, uh, our VP of uh, Data Analytics and Decision Science for the next one. Uh, it is in relation to design registration. And I, I, I do want to let the audience know that I am trying to read the questions as, uh, as completely and as received as I can. Um, so the question reads, Ab, I am aware of a significant delay in the pressure vessel design registration process. I know of several very experienced engineers who have applied to fill the vacancies and improve the design review process, but they have never received a reply from your organization. This does not help the bureaucratic system, and it looks like you are not interested in improving the review time. I'm wondering if you can make some comments on that, Bob. Yeah, thank you, Phil, and uh, thank you for the question. Um... This has been an important issue for us, and um, we are in full agreement with the person who asked this question that uh, we, um, uh, we need to make progress, and, and we have. Uh, so at the peak of the backlog, uh, we experienced, or better said, our clients were experiencing uh, 120 days turnaround time, and uh, we have managed to reduce that over time. Uh, right now it is below uh, 60 days, and we know that that is still longer than our standard of 30 days. So we are progressively working towards that. Uh, we are doing that in 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 a number of ways. Um, we, we have hired people and uh, filled vacancies. So I can't fully comment right now on um, how we have interacted with all the individual uh, applicants, uh, but we. We have hired uh, people, uh, we have reallocated resources from other departments, and we uh, also have uh, hired a contractor to support us with reducing that turnaround time to where it uh, needs to be. Other things that we have done is we have made improvements to our processes uh, to allow for more efficiency. Uh, we have used uh, technology as well to help us um, with, with making sure that we are as quick as possible in turning um, items around. It is important uh, that we uh, continue to do our process well. So I'd like to thank you for your patience uh, that you have had with us and uh, we hope to be back to um, our normal turnaround times of 30 days 
um, within the next few months. So I hope this provides uh, an, an answer to uh, what we have done this far to address the uh, client service issue that we had earlier this year and are still uh, resolving right now. Thank you, Ab. Uh, next question I'm going to pass to Lisa Prescott, who is our VP of Operations. And the question reads, you discussed remote inspections where the end user is saying it is 50% faster and the app is being looked at. Now that COVID is over, why cannot technical safety not go back to in-person inspection? So I'm wondering, Lisa, if you can comment on the work we're doing on uh, assessment. Sure. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Phil. Uh, prior to COVID, we did limited, limited remote inspections. And with COVID, our use of remote inspections was expanded greatly. While we've now ramped back up our physical inspections, we found that the use of remote inspections enabled us to increase the total number and reach of ins our inspections. We continue to research and study the effectiveness of remote inspections and to further refine the circumstances and situations for which remote inspections are appropriate. We're currently using them typically in lower risk situations or as follow-up to a physical inspection. But what we find with the addition of remote inspectors, inspections to our available regulatory tools, we've increased both the effectiveness and efficiency of our assessment program, and we plan to continue to use both physical and remote inspections going forward. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Kate Bailey, I'm going to ask you to uh, come back for this next one. And the question reads, with your stated people-centric focus... Are you going to reopen the offices to the public so that I can see an actual person? Okay, thanks for the question. So um, right now our offices are open for exams. So we do still do exam invigilation in person. We are currently not open for um, in-person services, the services that you could call in for or, um, to, or you could manage through our portal and online services. Um, this is simply a matter of um, efficiency and staffing. We want to make sure that we are very much focused on, on being as efficient as possible, particularly in the economic climate that Wes described, um, as well as making sure that people are accessing the other channels that we have uh, to, be, uh, to, to participate in the safety system. Um, so there is no current plan to reopen those offices uh, that are not open. Currently, we do our, our our office at Renfrew in Vancouver um, is actually open um, every day of the week uh, for in-person service, but our regional offices will not be open for, uh, for in-person service uh, in the near future. That said, we're continually monitoring our client feedback, and uh, should it be uh, deemed to be a channel that we wish to reopen, we absolutely will, and we will certainly let you know when that happens. Great. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, next question, I'm going to hand to Derek, uh, VP of Regulatory Leadership. Derek, the question is, what authority do you have on First Nations land? How do you enforce safety? Thank you for the question. Um, we do have authority on First Nations land, and we, um, we try to work in a uh, collaborative way with Indigenous communities. And um, we try to work from uh, a standpoint of supporting on education when needed, and also um, looking at uh, where there are safety issues. If we're called in to look at something, we'll, we'll identify safety issues. And we also will support if there has been a, an event that has happened in an Indigenous community, some incident, we will go in and investigate that as well. And also where there are some larger projects in the province, such as LNG projects, there are some LNG projects that are actually have an uh, indigenous ownership is involved in the project. And so we will work with that community and that leadership group in terms of exploring how the safety management plan should work for that uh, particular project. Great. Thank you, Derek. Uh, I'm going to ask Ob to come back for this next one. Um, there's probably lots to talk about, but maybe uh, 
maybe you can do a few highlights. The question is, what are the biggest learning opportunities from recent incidents in the province and how is Technical Safety BC working to prevent the next incident? How do you aggregate this incident data for actionable insight? Lots to talk about indeed. Um, this is uh, an important uh, area for us and we, we learn collectively from incident in, in two ways. Um, the, the, the first one is through incident investigation, where we, uh, where we find out what happened and, and what were the root cause, causes of the incident and uh, what can we do to prevent uh, uh, recurrence uh, in, in, in the future. So, so we, um, we, we look very carefully what happened on this specific site, uh, what is unique to the site and what, what needs to be done differently in the future. But we also look, and that's probably more important, to what is happening in our safety system in general, including on the site, but also in other places. And how, how can we make a change PC-wide? That's where the true value is. And um, one of the items that has become very apparent over the last over the last few years, uh, including the incidents that uh, some of the incidents that happened uh, this year, um, is, is the importance of qualified people. Um, qualified people are um, in the in the best position to identify hazards uh, that are hidden to people who don't have the specific training. So, so we will continue to make sure that we have uh, the right qualified people. Um, doing jobs on technical systems in, in British Columbia. That is, that is one of our key findings and we are working diligently with the industry um, to make sure that that um, happens. Another way um, is to, to see the, the patterns over time um, and uh, the data that we collect in our uh, incident investigations uh, are shared with our um, safety system risk um, team. Um, that team specifically looks at um, uh, multiple um, data and inspection records and uh, uh, based on that, trying to find the patterns and see what, what are the main issues that we uh, need to work on. So that, that's another key way, um, maybe more structural, that we look to uh, safety improvements as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, the next question, I'm going to let our VP people uh, answer one of the questions. So, um, and now I've lost, there it is. Okay, Kate Parker, if you can join us. And the question goes, good morning and thanks for hosting this session. Does Technical Safety BC have any initiatives currently with a specific focus on psychological health and safety in the workplace? If so, could you tell us a bit about the strategy and who is leading related projects? Kate Parker. Thank you, Phil. And thank you for the question. This is something that's really important um, to us at Technical Safety BC and to me personally. When we consider health and safety at Technical Safety BC, we don't just consider the physical bodies of our employees. But in fact, we recognize that mental health is just as important, if not even more, to being um, to be able to perform work and to be a thriving part of our community in British Columbia. So we have a number of um, initiatives that are involved. Um, and these actually started prior to COVID-19, where we know that um, across the globe, we started to talk about mental health more often. So the first program that we use is a program um, called Road to Mental Readiness, which is a program that all of our employees um, go through, providing everyone with a really strong understanding and language for talking about mental health at work. Um, all of our leaders are also educated in supporting our employees, um, as we know that um, in the last three years, mental health has been a really cha huge challenge across our organization. Additionally, our um, employees that are uh, client facing, so those are safety officers as well as our um, uh, client experience, are supported to um, help employees or help individuals who may be struggling in the community. So they um, have education to work with people who may be struggling, uh, may be angry or having um, a difficult time, so that we're ensuring that not only are our safety officers and our employees in the organization being supported, but externally 
um, we're connecting with our clients in a way that is safe and supportive for them as well. Uh, finally, I will share that a number of our programs, uh, including our extended benefits, uh, ways in which we work together, um, and the ways in which we support people who are struggling, those programs are in place and continually bolstered to ensure that our employees are able to come to work healthy, both physically and mentally. Back to you, Phil. Great. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I think this is a, a question that's worth um, talking to a bit, and I'm going to ask um, Lisa Prescott to support, and maybe I can also offer a few comments, but the question reads like this. Currently, I have spent $60,000 in permits in the last seven years in Prince George. Our, it says our inspectors are great. I'm, it could be the, uh, the contractors, internal inspectors, or maybe they're referring to our safety officers. Approximately 10% of our permits get physically inspected. So that means that $54,000 of my dollars spent get pushed through with no inspection of which I have no issues. Uh, it says so. So why does Technical Safety BC feel the need, uh, feel then the need to uh, extra bill eighty nine dollars in a deficiency if a deficiency is found? I'm already paying the inspections to do their job. So I wonder if we can talk a little bit about our inspection approach, um, Lisa, and then uh, any of the the rebilling that we do. And certainly, I can top up if there's anything that I think is worth saying, Lisa. Sure, thank you, Phil, and thank you for the question. Um, and thank you also for taking out all those permits. We really appreciate your participation in the safety system. That's great, that's what we're working towards. So the, the fees that we charge as part of our permits are used to support a number of services, uh, both covering the cost of our safety officers and our, our staffing and our safety system services, but also another a number of safety services that we offer that don't have fees. And so that differential that you, you mentioned about the cost of the permits uh, and seeing only about 10% physical inspections, that differential goes to funding a number of those services that we offer that don't have fees. So for example, our public safety notices, uh, incident investigations, a number of the education programs that we offer, including tech talks and some of our safety campaigns, as well as code development and training provider recognition. We also have a lot of foundational work that we do, our IT infrastructure, the client portal. So there, there's a lot behind uh, what goes out and support all of our safety officers who are out in the field. So, so thank you for that. And so we set our permit fees. It's really about looking at um, that first inspection. And if a reinspection is required, that, that fee isn't built into the cost of the permit. And so that's why we charge that additional fee when you, when you need to see a safety inspector again and they do a follow-up inspection. Phil, was there anything that you wanted to add? I think that's absolutely perfect. Um, I think the only thing I was thinking of is that we typically run, I think last year we ran uh, somewhere around 18 or 19 percent presence, as we refer to it. So about 19 percent of the electrical installation permits get looked at, um, and that there is a risk-based approach to determining which ones we do. And so it, it would seem that maybe the person asks or the uh, licensee asking the question is probably does very good work, and therefore may not see us quite as much as some others. Is that is that a fair comment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do risk assess all of our, our permits. Um, we have a machine learning system. That's one of the channels that we use. We also have policy decisions on particular higher risk areas that we would say are mandatory for inspections. And on top of that, we have the expertise and knowledge of our safety officers who look at each and every permit application to assess the risk that they think that that application has in addition to the machine learning score and any of the policy decisions that we have. So if you're not getting inspected um, that frequently, that means that all of those things are saying that you are a low risk. So thank you so much again for participating in the safety system by taking out all those permits and for doing compliant work. We really appreciate it. Great, thank you. So I'm getting a signal, one more question. Is that, and then also, I mean, I'll remind everyone that we will answer all of the questions and post them on our website. Um, Derek, I'm gonna send this last question to you. So Derek Patterson, VP Regulatory Leadership. And I'm wondering if it's an opportunity to also talk a little bit about the compliance and enforcement team that we have and the work that we do, but I'll read the question. It says, as a licensed contractor 
and responsible trade person, we always ask homeowners and other individuals for permit and inspection, but sometimes clients are not interested um, and they go, I think, with low ballers uh, without any permit and inspection. No penalty by the city and Technical Safety BC to them. I'm wondering if you can speak into that question. Yeah, I really appreciate that question because I know it's hard, particularly if you're a licensed contractor and you're taking your responsibility to take out permits and to be fully a fully compliant actor. And then you know that there's other, other parties out there, other contractors who are willing to play loose with the system. That's hard to take because that's taking money out of your pocket. So I just want to acknowledge how appreciative we are of that. Um, and there's a couple of things here. One is I would, where you think there's a real concern that uh, a homeowner or some other op owner is not going to take out a permit, um, you, can, you can inform us of that concern and we can follow up on that. Um, I think you can also try and underline to the, the homeowner or whoever that there's reasons that you are asking them to take out a permit. It's to support you as a contractor and taking out your, your license fee that you have to pay and for employing qualified individuals who get, get the training that they need to do safe work. And so they may be saving a few dollars on a permit, but explain to the homeowner that you know they may have individuals who are not fully up to speed with what code requirements are. So um, there's a reason you sometimes get things cheaper. So. Um, but we do, as an organization, take the, the gray market or the underground economy very seriously. And we do look through our records. We have different um, data tools that we utilize to identify if we think certain contractors may not be pulling all the requisite permits. And we do follow up on that. We do do audits. And we do also undertake education campaigns for the public and for contractors to explain the importance of taking out permits and the value you get from working with a licensed contractor. And lastly, I'd just say we, we also have the new advertising regulations, which are to highlight that um, licensed contractors, anyone who's advertising for regulated work has to put their licensed contractor number in the advertisement. And that's really to benefit the licensed contracting community and, and the public so that those who are not licensed are are more easily identified. And so we can follow up and help take them out of the mix when possible. So again, thanks for your question and for, uh, and for really doing what you can to support the safety system. We appreciate that. Okay, well, thank you very much, Derek. And I think we are getting ready to go to our breakout sessions. Yeah, and I will now, so thank you for your questions. And I know there are more that we didn't get to, we will uh, respond to those and post them on our website. Uh, thank you very much for your interest and your questions. I'll now pass it back to Emily. Thank you, Phil, and the executive team for answering all of those great questions. Now that you've heard about our organization's performance in 2022, we, we are pleased to share that the 2022 State of Safety and our annual report are both available on our website, technicalsafetybc.ca. The annual report details our business transformation, financial performance, and strategic priorities. Meanwhile, the state of safety provides a snapshot of how everyone in the safety system is working together to improve safety in our province. We encourage you to review these reports on our website after today's event. And with that, it's almost time to start our breakout sessions. One that will focus on how we're responding to climate emergencies and adapting to the changing environment, and one about our approach to assessments where we'll be sharing how we're improving the way we assess safety risks in BC. If you want to participate in either session but haven't pre-registered, you can still join. The links for each session have been added to the Zoom chat. As we close out this portion of today's event, I want to thank each of you for spending your morning with us. We hope you have learned more about the state of safety in our province and the strategic direction of Technical Safety BC. Safety is a shared responsibility, and we appreciate all you have contributed to the safety system over the past year. After the event, we will be circulating a post-event survey. We hope that you take the time to provide us with your feedback. We also invite you to stay connected with us in all of the different ways shown on the screen. 
Thank you again for attending this year's Core Connections. Enjoy the breakout sessions.